Hello, I'm Julian Mongenajera. I'm here in the middle of a velvet worm habitat. And in this video, we'll learn how to keep them in captivity and how to reproduce them. How to keep and reproduce velvet worms on a Kafra by Julian Monhinahira, Jeremy Rubin, and Mackenzie Harrison. Velvet worms, or anacophrins, are ancient creatures that looked essentially the same hundreds of millions of years ago. When you look at one of them, you are getting a glimpse into a world long past. Their bodies and unusual method of capturing prey by shooting sticky slime set them apart from all other life forms. Sadly, many species exist as tiny, isolated populations, making them vulnerable to habitat loss and environmental changes. By keeping them in captivity, you have a rare opportunity to contribute to scientific knowledge. Their biology is remarkably unexplored, and you could document previously unknown behaviors and characteristics, making vital contributions to our understanding of these enigmatic animals. In this video, I will provide you with the knowledge you need to establish and maintain a healthy and, hopefully, reproducing colony of velvet worms in captivity. I wrote the script for this video using recommendations by Jeremy Rubin and Mackenzie Harrison, and I am very thankful for their kind permission and assistance in producing the video. Keeping velvet worms in captivity presents unique challenges. These animals require very specific environmental conditions, and they are extremely sensitive to sudden changes and handling. If you only want to know the three basic things to keep them in terraria, they are simple. Faithfully reproduce in your terraria a little piece of ground and vegetation from their original habitat, avoid any sudden changes in moisture and temperature, and do no touch them. If you need to move them around, provide a leaf on which they can walk by themselves and once they are on it, move the leaf and allow them to slowly reach the new place. Let's start with the essential. The terrarium. Size matters. Ensure the enclosure is large enough to prevent overcrowding and made of non-toxic materials. For most velvet worms, which are a few centimeters long, a terrarium with a base of at least 20 by 30 centimeters and a height of 20 centimeters is recommended. However, common food containers, 20 by 14 by 9 centimeters, can be suitable for the tiny Australian species, provided they are properly closed. All terraria must have a secure lid and some form of ventilation, but remember that they will escape through any opening larger than a couple millimeters. As a rule, any opening larger than one-eighth of their diameter will be enough for them to squeeze through and escape, due to their soft bodies and lack of a hard skeleton. Ventilation is also important to avoid the buildup of molds. But there is no need to have too much of it, as it can cause the substrate to dry. Substrate is a key element. Use a deep and moisture-retentive substrate, similar to the leaf litter of their natural environment. Good options are a mix of cocoa coir, peat moss, and finely shredded bark. Aim for a substrate depth of at least 5 to 10 centimeters. Make sure the substrate is always moist but never waterlogged. Mist it regularly with distilled or demineralized water. For safety, you can boil and rinse materials to kill fungi. Temperate mosses should be avoided as they tend to introduce unwanted guests like snails. Now, let's talk about temperature and humidity. Velvet worms thrive in a stable temperature range, ideally between 18 to 24 degrees Celsius or 64 to 75 Fahrenheit. Avoid temperature fluctuations as they stress the animals. You can use a low wattage heat mat or a small heater with a thermostat. The humidity must be high, around 80 to 95 percent. Use a hygrometer to monitor levels and mist regularly to keep things moist but not dripping wet. Remember, excessive moisture can cause fungal growth, which is fatal to velvet worms. It's important to note that velvet worms can drown. High levels of nitrites and nitrates, which are produced through natural biological cycles, can also burn their sensitive skin. Place several small shelters, such as pieces of bark, cork, or leaf litter inside the terrarium. If they cannot hide, they will soon die from stress-related problems. Feeding is another important aspect of velvet worm care. In nature, these animals are predators, so you can offer a variety of invertebrate prey, including crickets, springtails, fruit flies, earwigs, locusts, captive-bred house spiders, harvestmen, apillions, flightless houseflies, small cockroaches, and isopods. To avoid residual pesticides or parasites, 
Ensure all prey is captive bred. Powdery blue isopods, Porcelanoids pruinosus, are an excellent secondary prey option due to their soft exoskeletons, which allow for more complete consumption and their ease of culture. If not eaten, these isopods will act as temporary custodians, consuming mold and waste within the enclosure, and can serve as a supplemental food source between larger, periodic feedings. Rather than using live prey, which may be unethical in itself, use freshly killed prey that has been humanly euthanized by, for example, freezing it. This will prevent many problems, including contamination, reduced growth rates in the velvet worms, and injuries that may be caused when they fight with the prey. The size of the prey should match the size of the velvet worms. Use smaller prey for smaller species or babies. Start by offering small amounts every two to three days, or larger prey once a week. Always observe if the animals are feeding and adjust as needed. You may place a small dish of water for your animals. Never use tap water. Always use distilled or demineralized water to avoid any kind of chemical contamination. After the terrarium is set up and food is provided, regular observation is very important. Note their behavior, feeding, molting, and overall health. If a problem or change is identified, take the necessary steps to correct it. Anacophrons desiccate easily so they only become active when it is dark or at least humidity is high, so they can be stimulated by light rainfalls or foggy conditions and low light levels. In a terrarium, this can be replicated with a light mist and low light levels. They will retreat if disturbed by bright lighting. When at rest, they typically squeeze into tight spaces under moss or wood and are often found in small social groups. They cannot dig their own burrows but will utilize small hollows within the substrate. Over time, as the substrate shifts or the velvet worms flex their bodies, the size of these cracks can increase, creating an extensive network of cavities where individuals may sequester themselves. During the day and evening, they can often be observed against the glass in a dark corner below the substrate surface. They grow by shedding their skin, similar to snakes. In the days leading up to a molt, they may appear alarming as they become less active and a white, reflective layer with a soft texture covers their skin. This should not be mistaken for a fungal infection. During the molt, they will become reclusive but may shed in the open by hanging onto a plant or piece of wood. The shed skin, which takes several hours to be fully discarded, will resemble a tan or white ball of soft viscous fluid and should not be confused with mold or an open wound. After shedding, they will typically retreat for several days to recover. Disturbing them during this process may result in an interrupted molt, excessive stress, and potentially death. Stressed, sick, or dying velvet worms will slowly become more lethargic and develop patches of discolored skin that appear wet to the touch. Portions of their body may become less responsive. Antenna may not fully extend or appear glued together, various legs may stop reacting, and parts of their body may become sunken and immobile. These individuals should be isolated in a sterile container with moistened paper towel, used distilled water, and kept in a warm, dark space. While many ailments are deadly, quick action may result in a full recovery. If all individuals in a colony simultaneously react in a similar way, it may be due to excessive bacteria buildup non-visible fungal blooms, or imbalanced soil chemistry. In these cases, the substrate should be changed immediately. Regular maintenance is necessary for long-term success. It is important to replace the substrate every few months or once a year. Apparently, some mites are harmless, but still, keep an eye on them. Keep detailed records of the animal's behavior, feeding, molting, breeding, and any other issues you may encounter. Do make videos of any mating activity, egg laying or births, depending on the species, as well as of any interactions among individual velvet worms. Never forget to keep backup colonies. Pathogens, especially molds and slime outbreaks, can decimate colonies of velvet worms in captivity, and keeping multiple backup colonies is the best way to protect this important work. Breeding on a coffra can be challenging. Pay close attention to mating behaviors and signs of reproduction. The babies may first feed from the glue the mother uses to hold the prey. As the babies grow, they will start feeding directly from the same prey the mother eats. Juvenile care requires a similar setup as the adults, 
with special attention to prey size and humidity. Important! Remember, if for any reason you release onychophrons into the wild, do it exactly where you collected them. This is to prevent spreading diseases, altering delicate local environments, and falsifying future research on their genetics, biogeography, evolution, and conservation. By keeping them in captivity, you have the opportunity to record new observations for most species, as much of their biology is still unknown. Remember, keeping these incredible animals is a long-term commitment that requires dedication, patience, and ethical concern. If you cannot provide this, please do not start. The three key rules. Do not handle them, as their stress can cause disease and death. Reproduce in your terrarium a small piece of ground and vegetation from their original habitat, and avoid any sudden changes in moisture and temperature. Thank you. Care Basics by Jeremy Rubin and Mackenzie Harrison. Main video by Jeremy Rubin. Photographs by Jeremy Rubin, Mackenzie Harrison, Graham Wise and Plants Explorer. Script by Julian Monhina Hira. Disclaimer. Done with assistance from artificial intelligence, but all text and images reviewed by Julian and Jeremy. Thanks for watching this Velvet Worm Rearing Guide. If you're passionate about these amazing creatures, please subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss future updates. We post new videos occasionally.